I won the lottery of life. I was born in Australia in the 1940s and I've lived in a time when I've never had to go to war. I was just a bit old for Vietnam. And it's interesting because we take for granted some of the fantastic advantages we have from this stable democracy. Business people like myself, we, we love to think that it's our own natural brilliance that have allowed us to make some money. But most of us is the fact that we live here in Australia, which is such a fantastic place. A little bit about my background. I was born in 1944 in Roseville on Sydney's North Shore. I was hopeless at school. I couldn't actually say the letter S until I was eight years of age and I clearly remember at Roseville Public School when I was hauled out in front of the class because there was a new teacher and everyone had to stand up and say their name. And I stood up and said, Dick Fish. <laughs> and then put on a bit of a funny little act and uh, then I said my name was Dick Miff and uh, sort of jumped up and down a bit. Finally, the teacher brought me out in front of the class. All the kids were screaming with laughter because they knew I couldn't say yes. And I was too dumb to say, I can't say my name, and I was sent to the principal, who then rang my mother, and my mother said, well, he's got a speech defect. And it was quite interesting because I felt quite inferior in those days. I ended up doing the intermediate certificate at North Sydney Technical High, and I remember I got 7% out of 100 for French and my parents remember I used to come home and try and learn the French vocabulary and they would know it and my sister would know it who became a pharmacist but I wouldn't know it. I just found it was incredibly difficult to learn. I was hopeless at sport but I loved the out of doors. I joined the Cubs and the Scouts and I used to fiddle with radio bits and pieces. It appears at that time my parents said to each other, whatever will happen to Dick? <laughs> they were very worried. It's interesting, at North Sydney Technical High, I had my first chance to come down to this region. I loved the industrial visits and we came down and saw the Lysites factory. And even though I was no good academically, I could fix things. I could pull my Sturmey Archer bicycle gearbox together and put it back together. I built my first crystal set when I was about eight years of age. And then at about 14, I built a noughts and crosses computer that would, out of telephone parts, this is before modern electronics, could actually play noughts and crosses. My first job was in a factory. I'd actually managed to get an apprenticeship into radio. In those days, for the first four years of your apprenticeship, you were used basically as a process worker. And I was working at the back bench of Western Electronics, pop riveting valve sockets into two-way radio, taxi two-way radio chassis. I remember the valve sockets never fitted, so I had to get a file out and file the hole so it would fit properly. And I really thought I was a failure because when I left school, quite a few of my friends said, oh, Dad said I should do radio engineering, and so they went off to university. And I thought, this is not fair. I'm, I know a lot about radio, and how come these people are going to be far ahead of me? I tried to get into the DCA. It's funny, the Department of Civil Aviation uh, technicians in training and uh, they wouldn't take me. It was interesting because so many years later I became chairman of the Civil Aviation Authority. <laughs> <laughs> and I could look down at all the people who managed to get into the course. And I also tried to get into the ABC technicians in training but I didn't pass that one. My life changed in 1968 when with $610 with my young fiance Philippa McManamy uh, we put in $610. I always mention, by the way, I put in $600 and Pip put in $10 in case we ever get divorced. That's how it's divided up, isn't it? I don't know if there are any legal experts here. But with $610, I started a little firm called Dick Smith Electronics, fixing cab radios and selling car radios. And I was on my... I just loved running a business. And I had a good uh, way with the customers. And... Within a year, my accountant said to me, Dick, do you realise you've made more money than the Prime Minister of Australia? Now, I said, how have I done that? Because in those days, the Prime Minister got about $30,000. And my accountant showed how, with the sales I'd made with the extra stock, I remember saying, but I haven't got any money. Why don't I have any money? And he said, well, you're putting it all back in. You're paying your tax. You're increasing your stock and so forth. After about two years, I decided I'd get into the electronic components business. And a very interesting thing happened. I kept my car radio two-way radio business and down the road I started Dick Smith Wholesale selling electronic components. And within five months, my manager left 
And when I went down to run the business myself, I found that about $18,000 of stock was stolen. We called the police in and they said, oh, this person, we know him well, we've never got a conviction against him, but he's a fraudster. I found that my business would have to close down. I remember talking to an accountant and he said, Dick, you've got to liquidate the business. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, you just sell off what you've got and pay back what you can and the loss will be about $18,000. And I said, how will I ever face people again? And he said, well, that's life. You know, the stock's been stolen. It was a proprietary company. And he could see I was worried, so he said, well, there's an alternative. He said, you could appoint a receiver who will let you trade out, pay the money back. And I said, well, that's what I'll do, and I'll pay the money back, and then I'll close it down. It was a very expensive and a good lesson not to extend yourself. The interesting thing is, and I'm not religious, but I believe in karma, which I'll mention later, in trading the business out of its problems over the next two-year period, I realised, wow, there's more money in selling electronic components than in fixing car radios and two-way radios. And that business... Dick Smith Wholesale, receiver and manager appointed, nine years later I sold to Woolworths for $25 million. So it's interesting, by doing the right thing, and I must admit it was mainly because I didn't want to have my name, people thinking that Dick Smith could lose someone's money, in doing the right thing, it turned out okay. Now during that time I I rode the booms, remember the home computer boom, the telephone answering machine boom, TV games, Absolutely fantastic. And I also remember the CB radio boom. Now this magnificent bit of literature here is called Dick Smith's Australian CB radio handbook. And uh, in it, it's dedicated, and I want to read this to you. This book is dedicated to my friend Cara, Ken Harris and the Wollongong truckies who helped fight for the legislation of CB radio. I will never forget the day I looked down from the Wollongong courthouse and saw a gigantic convoy of trucks, aerials glinting in the sun, rolling from the coal loader to the court. I knew then the battle was just about over. Thanks, Ken, we fought and won. It sounds a bit like the Third World War, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the amazing thing was that it was my first experience with community empowerment and doing something in, in that particular time. It was my own self-interest. CB radios were very common all around the world, but they weren't allowed in Australia. In Australia, you had to get a ham radio licence. So what happened? All the truckies bought them and they were pirates. And occasionally the government would find them. And I thought, well, if we could ever licence these things, we were selling huge quantities. If they were licensed, we'd sell even greater quantities. And so I got to, with the truckies and with the young CB radio enthusiasts, I went to and from Canberra, met Tony Staley, the minister, and over a period of time, we managed to get CB radio legislated. I used not only the community, but the media. We staged protests. Uh, we did everything we could. The, the bureaucrats made some extraordinary claims. I remember one was that the CB radio band, which was used in America, and all of these radios were on, were used by the Australian Army for missiles. And I remember saying, hold on, if that's so, there's already 20,000 truckies operating on the frequency. <laughs> Your missiles must be running astray. <laughs> so it was legalised. We managed to get CB radio legalised. It taught me a great thing about adolescent boys because at that stage we were selling huge quantities because young boys could buy one of these radios. They were considered bad, naughty, against the law. No young child was ever prosecuted. Well, when we got it legalised, I thought the sales will go up. They basically stopped at that point <laughs> because here you had young people wanting to do something that was bad in their parents, in the government's eye, that was actually harmless. So it was just an interesting lesson. Now, I, I made a small fortune in Dick Smith Electronics, as I mentioned. When the company got to about 500 people, I didn't like it. I liked to know everyone and it was a great fun, it was a great adventurer, great adventure at the time. I was 38 years of age, so I sold to Woolworths and that would allow me to go adventuring, do more in the out of doors and move into philanthropy. Now it appears I said to my parents, my parents told me this years later, that as a little boy there was a lot of publicity at the time about Sir McPherson McRobertson and Sir Edwin Holstrom who were great philanthropists, I can't say the word, philanthropists. And I couldn't certainly say it when I was seven or eight. And I asked my mum, what do these people do? And she said, well, they're people who have done very well and 
they put something back into the country and help people. And it appears I looked at her and said, well, if ever I do very well, I'm going to become one of those. And this is what she told me years later. And it's interesting because one of the reasons I wanted to get into philanthropy was because I, and my parents always set the example. They never had any money. Dad was a manager in a bookshop. But they were in the Progress Association, the Scouts, everything. Like you people here who are involved in community activities. It was the, in East Roseville at the time, it was a small suburb where luckily everyone rolled up the sleeves and were part of it. In those days we didn't sit around and say the government should do it. People did it themselves. I also went adventuring and uh, I flew around the world and from pole to pole, taking quite a lot of risk. Just halfway through the trip going around the world, I thought I might kill myself. So I had a will reading. I remember this. It was I invited all the people up to uh, Dick Smith Electronics. Uh, they let me use the office even though I'd sold out. And I always wanted to give a million dollars away. And I thought, well, I'll do it one day. But then I thought, if I die, well, I won't have the pleasure from giving it away. So I had a will reading where we gave a million dollars to everything from Tony Kidman with muscular dystrophy to the Aboriginal radio network in Alice Springs, uh, to lots of different causes. And people used to say, oh, you're a great bloke for doing this. And I said, no, it's actually quite selfish. It makes me feel good. And I also believe in karma. And that is, if you do the right thing, right things will happen to you. And that certainly happened to me. I've got far more out of my country than I've ever put back into my country. And I've had far more enjoyment being able to put my money into good causes than I've ever had in making it. It's very, very simple. I was involved with Ted Knoffs and life education. And I remember building the electronics for the life education centres. Life education is a wonderful movement which is booming today. It teaches young children what effect drugs have on the body. It doesn't say don't take drugs. It just says this is the wonderful human body that we've got. And this is the effect it will have on the body if you take any drugs, legal or illegal drugs. And it's the most wonderful system. And that's really when I was involved in community partnership because most of the life education centres and then vans were run and money was raised by volunteers. Now at the time it was interesting because I, I, I remember picking up Women's Weekly one day and there was a typical advertisement for Peter Jackson cigarettes and it had a young girl who looked 15, on a park bench with her legs around a handsome looking bloke and it said, Peter Jackson 25's, you're laughing. And I wasn't laughing, I can tell you. First of all, I found the girl was a German model who's 27 years of age. They had to use models over a certain age. But she was purposely picked because she looked 15. And I remember saying to Ted, Noss, this is ridiculous, I'm putting my money into educating children about the effects of drugs and then our worst drug of the lot, cigarettes with 30% of young teenage girls smoking, I'm being undermined by these capitalists who are selling cigarettes and marketing them in a way which is obviously to encourage kids. I'm a marketing person and the cigarette company said, oh no, we don't want to sell to kids, we only sell to adults. That's rubbish. Uh, adults don't start smoking, children start smoking. Once they're addicted and they become of an age they'd like to stop, it's very hard to stop. So I started a campaign and I got some help from Dr Paul Magnus of the Heart Foundation and he said to me, do you realise Dick Richard Walsh, who's now a good friend of mine, is a doctor, a medical doctor, he's the publisher of Women's Weekly. Why don't we do an ad? And so we quickly worked out an ad that said, uh, Richard Walsh, you're the publisher of Women's Weekly, you're also a father of young children. What do you tell your kids about smoking? And we ran it in Women's Weekly. They accepted it, believe it or not. <laughs> I then decided to run ads. Amatil, I think, was the big cigarette seller at the time. And it had the Knights of the Realm on the board. So Geoffrey Yeend and everything. So I ran an ad naming them all, saying to the board of Amatil, naming them all, what do you tell your children about cigarettes? Wow, they didn't like it. I remember at one stage, Murdoch Press said they had to run cigarette advertising because it was some part of a freedom and... Uh, they said they were obligated to do it because they were given the ad. So I wrote this outrageous ad attacking the people who were uh, calling the uh, cigarette sellers drug pushers, which they were and are, and Murdoch refused to run the ad. So we went to court. I took them to court. 
and eventually the court decided that we could run the ad, of course. And of course, the Murdoch press didn't have to run the ads. Now, the amazing thing is that over a two or three year period of just communicating to the public more than anyone else, gradually the politicians followed. And as you know, we have some of the most restrictive marketing laws for cigarettes in the world, which is good. And the smoking of young teenage girls has gone from something like 30% down to 15%. Not just for that reason, but it's sure helpful if you're not making out cigarettes as something attractive and grown up. It's interesting, talking about these little boys who wanted their CB radio when it was illegal, inverted commas, but didn't want them when it was legal. One of the best marketing part places by the cigarette industry was they had a sign that they'd put up in grocery shops and anyone selling cigarettes and it said, warning, $5,000 fine for anyone selling cigarettes to a person under 18. That's a great way of getting people under 18 to buy cigarettes. If they'd made the fine $100,000, even more people under that age because it was more daring. So that's why the cigarette companies were supplying the signs and insisting someone put them up everywhere. The problem was that I was a marketing person. I then started Australian Geographic magazine and it did incredibly well. I was interested as a kid in both the Art of Doors through Scouts and in radio. Well, Dick Smith Electronics was the radio side, Australian Geographic was the Art of Doors. And there we had some most wonderful community involvement. We completely refurbished the Australian Inland Mission site in Inaminka in South Australia. We rebuilt Sir Hubert Wilkins House in the northern Adelaide Hills, all by getting our members, we called subscribers members, and we said, we'll put the money in, but we need labour to help. And it was amazing how, as a business, we could involve our members, our subscribers, and how they loved being involved in what we do. I now have Dick Smith Foods, which is relatively small. It uh, sells peanut butter, breakfast cereal, it used to have about 30 lines, but gradually, as the companies we buy from are taken over by overseas companies, we can't buy from them anymore because our company sells Australian-grown food from Australian-owned manufacturers. And we don't really have time to talk about globalisation here. Globalisation has given us some great material advantages, but it's certainly given us some disadvantages. And the one of being able to support the small Australian company for someone to start a business or start two businesses like I did is almost impossible now, which is really sad. Not impossible, but almost impossible because the big companies are the way they go. They give products at very, very cheap prices without any doubt. And to start up in competition with Woolworths or Coles and compete on price would be very difficult. And it's interesting, I'd love to believe that Australians would all come and buy from an Australian supplier we tend to do that when there's some publicity on the importance of it, but after a while we go back and buy the product which is marketed the best and which is the cheapest. That's just human nature. Well, I've been in business for 41 years. I've been self-employed since the age of about 22. But I've had some involvement with government twice, once as, or twice as chairman of the CAA and also as chairman of the National Council for the Centenary of Federation. And you know what that taught me? It taught me why the Soviet Union collapsed. <laughs> I was absolutely amazed that any decision could be made at all. And I could understand the problem. Here I was, an outside person as chairman, trying to motivate my people who were working for me, bureaucrats, to make decisions. And one of them said to me, Dick, you don't seem to understand. If we don't make any decisions, we'll probably have a good career to when we retire. If we make 99 correct decisions and one wrong, that will be the one that will be beaten up in the newspaper, that will be the one that will embarrass our minister and that will be the one that will stop us in our career path. And they're absolutely right. It was interesting how I on the outside being of independent means uh, could say what I wanted to say. Quite often when I walk down the road in places, people come up to me and they want to shake my hand and I think that's wonderful. And the, most, the best compliment they ever give me, they say, Dick, thanks for saying it how it is. And I'm in this incredibly fortunate position. And I think of my dad who went off to the Solomons to fight in the Second World War. I think of my uncle who lost his life. So we have the freedom to say, in effect, what we want to say, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And I've used that to the hilt 
and I have to say what a fantastic country this is. I remember when, if you remember if you're reading in the media, you would have heard that Dick Smith supported David Hicks. Well, I didn't support David Hicks. I didn't know David Hicks. I certainly supported and wanted David Hicks to have a trial in front of a jury. And the interesting thing was that in the initial stages, the first six months, I got the most incredible emails. I couldn't believe such people would, could exist in Australia. Uh, attacking me and saying in the most rednecked, rabid way, how could I be supporting this terrorist? And I'd write back to any of them that happened to give a name that we could write back to saying, well, no, I'm, I just want the bloke to have a proper trial. And as you know, we didn't end up getting a trial, but at least he's back here now in Australia. I know David Hicks relatively well. I helped him get a job. He's working hard. And I can tell you, he's not a supporter of terrorism. What happened there was a great injustice. But the amazing thing that happened to me, uh, the Reader's Digest run a, an article every year on the most respected, or most trusted, I think they call it, and my friends had said to me, Dick, uh, don't know if you're doing the right thing, you're very brave, but you're going to destroy your good name. Uh, when I initially said David Hicks should have a proper trial, and I said to them, well, you're probably right, but my dad risked his life for freedom of speech and doing the right thing and being fair, I'm going to risk my name that's a very small amount to pay. The wonderful thing about Australia is that I did drop off the top ten in the most trusted for one year. <laughs> David Hicks, by the way, is, was and then is currently number 100, right at the bottom, even under journalists and uh, people like that, <laughs> and, and lawyers and solicitors. But the amazing thing was the next year, what I found happened, after a while, the tide turned and people started writing to me and saying, good on you, you're doing the right thing. He should have a proper trial. And when the Reader's Digest came up with their last count, I'm in the first ten again. <laughs> so it actually, it's a credit to Australians when I took a risk, I didn't really care because I thought, I want this bloke and I feel actually as if I've been shortchanged because he's never had the trial that I wanted to see him in front of a jury because I believe the jury would have said, He's never supported terrorism. He went off as a do-gooder, inverted commas, to try and help people. He certainly got involved in the wrong people. It didn't work. But jumping that to saying he's, to me, a, a supporter of terrorism, that's a person who kills innocent people, is one of the most evil people on earth. It's amazing uh, when John Howard was in power, because our kids went to school with the Prime Minister's kids, I knew him quite well and I always had the phone number of Kirribilli House. I had that since Bob Hawke's Bob Hawk's days. And I'd ring him up and, and he'd say, I'll oh, come down and have a cup of tea. And so I'd come down on a Sunday and sit there having a cup of tea. And when I got involved with David Hicks, he said, Dick, I think you're making a big mistake. And he hinted there were things that I didn't know that he knew. And I remember saying, well, charge him, you know, put him in front of a jury. And he said, oh, we can't because we didn't have any law that covered terrorism. And I said, OK make the law retrospective. And he, I said, you do it for tax cheats? I said, who wants to be fair, or well, we want to be fair, but who wants to be kind to terrorists, supporters of terrorism? No, he wouldn't do that. And I think the reason he wouldn't make the law retrospective is he knew that they wouldn't get a conviction. But the interesting thing was that even though I came out publicly in Australia in an opposite view to the Prime Minister, it wasn't as if uh, he wouldn't talk to me or anything. He still talked to me, obviously just thought I was wrong on that particular issue. Of course, I don't think, and David Hicks now is busily trying to write a book, and I think it will be quite an eye-opener to many people. Now, it's interesting, this is a fantastic country. One of your discussions was about corruption. I can say in 42 years or whatever it is of business, I've never ever been in a place where it's been implied that I should bribe somebody, and none of my staff ever have. And I've had development applications every time we wanted a new Dick Smith store, Australian Geographic shop, we had to get things developed. And we never, I just think this is so fantastic about the country, because I thought surely one day someone is in, in a, an officialdom is going to hint that I should pay something, and I thought, gee, I'll get them, you know, I'll ring up the police and get a tape recorder and trap them. It's never happened. And I think that's abso absolutely fantastic about this country that you can grow two businesses and basically not like some of our Asian neighbours where business people I've spoken to there just say that corruption is part of running a business. 
It doesn't happen in Australia. And I want to give you an example of how honest it is that a number of years ago I was building a house up near Coffs Harbour and I had to get an approval to, they wanted me to clear around the house to stop the fire from coming, but I love the bush and the out of doors and I like trees to be right up to my window. So I was told that you could get a particular person from the fire brigade in Sydney who would inspect the house and give you a decision. And so I managed to talk to this person and uh, the plan was to meet at my house near Coffs Harbour and I was flying up in the helicopter so I invited, I said, well you can come up with me. Now the very next morning a phone call came saying, look Mr Smith, I can't come with you, it wouldn't be right, I have to make a decision, I'll have to drive there. And I thought he was absolutely right, but isn't that fantastic? Just fantastic. So it's a wonderful country that way. I do know there is some corruption, there is some dishonesty, but it's not endemic, it's not part of our way of life. I travel through Kazakhstan and Russia and a number of other of the stands and you get pulled over by the police all the time and they check your paperwork. And I was told by the locals there, oh, well, if your paperwork not right, you give them, you know, 10 rubles or whatever it is and you can go on your way. And we brought one of the people out from one of these countries to Australia and he, just for a few weeks holiday, because he helped me when my, my wife and myself were driving around the world, and he was driving my car and I said, hey, whatever you do, if a policeman pulls you over here, don't <laughs> try and give them some money, you'll end up locked up. <laughs> and we all know that in 99% of the situation. So that's wonderful about our country. Now I want to talk a little bit about giving because it's really sad to me that the philanthropists, I can't say the word, sorry, of the old, the Myers, the, the McPherson Morrisons, the, uh, the, the Sir Edward Holstroms, we don't have them like that anymore. Why is that? And I don't know the answer. Very, very sad and I think it's a bit to do with the culture of not being declared a do-gooder. And I'll give you an example. Years ago I started a rally, a trial called the Burke to Burke Town Bash. And those Burke to Burke Town Bashes have been going for 25 years. They've now raised $100 million net for variety. The first bash, I always, if I came up with an idea like Antarctic flights, I'd pick a charity to raise money for. And so with this car trial, the idea was we would have a car trial in the idea of the old Red X trials. I knew that lots of my friends were quite wealthy and would try and outdo each other with better cars, so I said, the car has to be 20 years old and the lower the value, the better, and if anyone has a car that's properly prepared for the rally, they'll be having points taken off for taking it seriously. <laughs> I then said, now the way we're raising money for variety and the only way you can raise money is by bribing the judges. I happen to be the head judge, I had minor judges, and by cheating. Now the amazing thing was this allowed wealthy people to be do-gooders but not to be looking as if they were do-gooders. And so on that first trial we raised quarter of a million dollars. I remember Singo bet $10,000 that he could win on the second day and Bob Hill said, oh, $15,000. So they're all raising this money for variety and it was allowing them to do something worthwhile but without being called a do-gooder. Quite fascinating. And the fact that those, I said to Tony Hashem of Variety, would you like to take this over? I always pick a charity. We've raised good money for Variety. Would you like to take it over? He grew it and grew it using the same principle of bribing the judges and cheating, all in a harmless way. And as I mentioned, $100 million have been raised. And I think, I don't quite know how we get around changing the ethos of most people. As I mentioned to you, I purely donate for the satisfaction it gives me, no other reason. And uh, it's a very, very simple, I'm a very simple person. I'm not an intellectual, as you probably noticed, I class myself as a qualified car radio installer. I once came up with the idea, because I want to mention tax. I had a friend who owned Capital Motors and he sold out for about $15 million and he went and lived in Monaco six months of the year. But one day when he came back, he loved Australia as we all do, and he said, Dick, how do you live in Australia? And I said, what do you mean? He said, the tax. And I said, well, I pay it. Oh. And here he was living in Monaco, which he didn't like, and travelling backwards and forwards all the time so he could reduce that tax amount. He could have paid the tax. He's probably died being worth $100 million or something, which probably his kids will waste. And just amazing to me. 
And I went to the Prime Minister about 15 years ago and they thought I was eccentric. I said, look, instead of publishing the top wealthiest business people in Business Review Weekly, you should do what the Japanese do, publish the top taxpayers. I said, why don't you give them a certificate, you know, top ta one of the top 100 taxpayers? Because I said then, believe it or not, human psyche being what it is, instead of the wealthy trying to have a bigger waterfront house or a slightly longer boat, they'll actually will think, oh, I've got to have one of those certificates on the wall. <laughs> you didn't notice it there sort of thing. And I've got the most immense satisfaction about paying tax. I fly along in my helicopter, I look down where people complain about how bad the roads are. I think I can't believe how good they are considering our small population. And that's an incredibly important point. Now, I want to move on to a new adventure, a new issue that I'm doing where I'm going to involve the community, and it's most important, it's population. About three months ago, my daughter Jenny rang me up, and I like to think that I'm the thinker of the family, but she got me here, and she rang up and she said, Dad, why don't they ever mention the elephant in the room when they talk about human-induced climate change? I said, what's that, Jenny? And she said, population. And I stopped and thought she was exactly right. We just had Copenhagen with huge conference costing millions of dollars where everyone discussed climate change, human induced, but didn't mention population. There wasn't even a person holding up a sign that said population question mark. And I was quite shocked that I'd never thought about it. Jenny also sent me a link to a YouTube video which was of a speech by a backbench federal Labor politician Kelvin Thompson, and in 10 minutes he just explained to me what I needed to know about the fact that we're not talking about the elephant in the room. We're suffering from climate change. We have a huge population increase at the moment in Australia, 2.1% per year, which if it goes on at this rate will mean 100 million people in Australia at the end of this century when my young granddaughter will most likely still be alive. And most people say, well, there's no way we could feed 100 million people in this country, let alone have water for it. It's interesting, since 1950, the world's population has doubled. It's currently 6.7 billion. And Australia has gone from something like 7.5 million to 22 million. And our Prime Minister recently welcomed a big Australia when it was announced that we're likely to be at 40 million or so in the 2050. He said, that's great, I support a big Australia. And I asked politicians, hold on, why don't we talk about this? And they said, oh, there's two reasons. One is Cardinal Pell and the other one is Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote to Cardinal Pell and he came back and said, I mean, he, he, he uh, confirmed what was said because he wrote back and said, we don't have enough people, we need more. And the Rupert Murdoch inference was because the Murdoch press is totally for growth. Every, everyone has to talk about growth. I've actually worked out the reason that it's not discussed. And it's mainly because one day we will have to get our capitalistic system, which operates in virtually every country in the world, including China, maybe not North Korea, we'll have to get it to work without growth. And no one wants to talk about it because we know we live in a closed system. This world has finite resources, so you just can't expand forever. And I am now working on communicating to people that we really have to discuss this, we have to debate it, we have to have a population policy. Common sense alone says we can't always grow. It's interesting, right at the moment we blame the Wall Street bankers in the United States for our current economic problems, but actually it's all our greed. Anyone who owns shares, can you put up your hand if you own shares at all, any shares? Well there you are, probably most people here. We all put pressure on the CEO of Woolworths or Coles to keep expanding because the shares are going to go down in value. So the board will throw out the chief executive if there's not constant growth. Whereas we all know that can't happen forever. So what we've got to do, I believe, is have a good debate on the subject, get the experts, the university people, to tell us, first of all, how many can Australia actually support? Of course, we could probably support 100 million in the short term by using every bit of uranium, by using every bit of coal, by desalinating water. Imagine this to grow crops. 
But why would you want to do that? One of the great things about Australia when you talk to fellow Australians is the small population, the great big country with not a lot of people. And of course, we should set an example to the whole world. It's interesting, if we want to reduce populations in so-called third world countries, all we have to do is educate women. What has been shown, if we put money into educating women, populations will go down. It's interesting, I must admit personally I don't want an Australia of 40 or 50 million, but it won't worry me. In fact, virtually none of us here will it worry. But it's going to worry our children and grandchildren. We think there is simply no way we could ever run out of food in the West. People who have predicted it in the past have been wrong because we're so ingenious as human beings, we can get the crop yields up. We can do the most incredible things with fertilisers. But you've got to remember, first of all, the crop yields are at the maximum now. Fertiliser comes from oil and we're not going to have oil all the time. And look at our prime farming land. Go down to Kayama, we're building houses on it to cope with the huge population increase as it is. It's interesting, nine out of ten people I speak to say we don't want a big population, whereas our prime minister is welcome, welcoming it. I think he's out of touch. So what we've got to do is talk about it. We've got to, once it started now, I'm working on a major documentary film which will communicate. I'm going to head off to Bangladesh because one of our politicians said, ha, oh, 40 million in Australia, that's not many, look at Bangladesh. So we'll go and have a look there. <laughs> We're going to have a look at Singapore. Would you like 10 Singapores from Sydney to... To Cairns? No, you wouldn't. We all cling to the coast. We've got a big country, but it's an arid country. I've flown around the world over every continent at low altitude in my helicopter, and I've seen how little farmable land there is in this world. And with climate change, I've got lots of wealthy mates who believe climate change is not happening and it's not human-induced. Well, people can self-delude themselves. Common sense alone says that if you put... 6.7 billion people on this planet and you're going to go to 9 billion and they'll want to raise theirs. Most of the people who've got a lower standard of living, lower material standard of living, they want to raise theirs and they have a right to raise it to ours, that it's simply impossible to do that without having a major effect on the environment. Now, I was supposed to talk about the roles that are played by philanthropy and what roles are played by community partnership. I hope I've given you some really good examples and I'd like to answer any questions about everything, even about adventure, which is my main love. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, um, okay so the usual protocol, we might start with uh, the far south and then we've got a roving microphone from here. Um, well, so far, no mobile phones, that's good. Let's keep this going. So, um, I'm wondering, are there any questions from Vega? Um, nothing at this stage, thanks, Glenn, but okay, we really enjoyed the talk. They're all making change down there, sorry. <laughs> okay, Karen, back to today. The question was, why haven't the United Nations and the International Panel on Climate Change picked up what I'm saying about population? It's really interesting. I'd love to know. Uh, one thing which I, I didn't mention here is that quite often people will try and link racism to, if you say at the present time we have an immigration rate of about 280,000 people per annum, more coming in than going out. And Kelvin Thompson believes we should reduce it to about 70,000. And, but still on a non-racial basis, of course. No one would ever think of changing that. Kelvin Thompson believes, and I agree, we should increase our humanitarian intake. But just why the United Nations... It's interesting, Al Gore, in his latest book, has a chapter on population. I think it's almost, as I mentioned, the elephant in the room just don't go there because it affects and 
so many people. As you know, the Catholic Church immediately links it to contraception, and I don't think it has to be linked to that. The interesting thing is there's one country in the world that is responsibly reducing its population. Have a guess what country? Italy. So they're either not doing it or not taking any notice of the Pope. I'm not sure <laughs> what. But I'm hoping maybe Australia is the place where we start by community empowerment of people just saying, not on, you can't talk about human climate change, human affected climate change without talking about humans. That's the first thing you've got to talk about. We need a world plan to start reducing this incredible increase and even reducing populations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Karen, another question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mark. Yeah, Dick, uh, you mentioned how well networked your parents were in their day with their community, and academics call that social capital. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, how our communities operate today? Yes, I would. Uh, the question was uh, that in my day, in the 1950s, as a kid, our parents networked, wasn't a word used then, but they were involved in the community. Less so now. I think it might start to go back to it. I noticed a good example is the scouting movement have been suffering with less and less members because scouts relies tremendously on volunteers. I love scouts. I started as a cub and ended up as a 23-year-old BP award. That's my proud only qualification. I've got a Baden-Powell award, which I'm very proud of. And it's interesting, scouts are now starting to get more and more uh, people joining scouts, m more volunteers to help. So I hope maybe everything goes in, in uh, a rolling movement, peaks and troughs, and whether we've gone through a selfish stage and whether we're now moving back to a stage where we roll up our sleeves and we help our community. I really hope that's happening. Thank you. All right, Karen, any others from Bacon's Bay? Uh, no, no, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, Brendan at Shoalhaven, I'm wondering, do you have any questions? Hi, Dick. It's Amanda from Shoalhaven. Um, you're talking about population. Do you plan to tackle sustainable consumption as you go through your population um, journey? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole key to it, of course, because, and it's quite amazing to me that this is not on the agenda anywhere. In other words, you can't talk about population without saying we have to have a sustainable world. We always talk about that, but at the same time, populations are increasing dramatically. There's no doubt in my mind that we can't even sustain the present 6.7 billion at a reasonable standard of living that people want. One thing I didn't mention, which is very important, we're told by my fellow capitalists, and I have to tell you, I've benefited from growth, benefited from growth, and I could say nothing. That would be the easy way out. But one of the most important points is that people say, if you have more Australians, if we go from 22 million to 40 million, as the Prime Minister would like, we have efficiencies of scale. Now, let's stop and think about that. Let's look at the United States of America. It has 300 million on about the same land area. That's 15 times our population. Let's look at the advantages they have from efficiencies of scale. Do they have better medical care than us? No, they don't even have universal health care. Do they have better schools? No. Do they have better roads? Well, maybe a few more freeways, but they're completely chock-a-block. You can't move in them in peak time anyway. Our gross national product, or GDP per capita, is about the same of the United States. So it does show, just by increasing numbers of people, you actually go backwards. You don't have... I think we're pretty well an optimum size, maybe even a little large now, Tim Flannery thought that our sustainable level was about 15 million. And uh, maybe he's right. Someone has written a document saying the sustainable level for the world, wait for it, is not 1 million, is 100 million people in the long term. I don't know if that's true, but that's 100 million having a standard of living where you have warmth on a cold night, you've got medical care, you've got care in old age and all of those things that we expect to be fair for all people on this earth. Thank you. Okay, any more from Shalhaven? <coughs> uh, no, no other questions. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, Brendan. Um, Penny, I'm wondering, are there any questions at Ross Vale? Yes, yes yeah. sir, we've got some. Okay. Looks like three. That's fine. Go. That's fine. Yeah, sure. 
Yes, it's just communicating to Australians we're this fantastic democracy and as I mentioned to you, people stop me in the street and they say, Dick, thanks for saying it how it is. And as I walked in, we had an Australian of the Year function uh, with the Governor General last night at Parliament House and as I walked in, I was grabbed by a very unsuspecting media, someone from AAP and the ABC. And they said, oh, you know, Dick Smith, will you say something about Australia? And they expected me to say, oh, it's the best country in the world and all of those things. And I, I, I think it's a very good country. I don't think it's the best in the world. I think that's ridiculous when you say things like that. But we are a very fortunate country. But I mentioned then uh, that I was going to be working on drawing people's attention to population. Now, it's interesting. It must have gone to air this morning because I woke up and I think I had 14 messages on my phone. I've done talkback right around Australia with virtually every talkback host agreeing with me and saying, this is a conspiracy, why haven't we been talking about it? And so I think you'll find very quickly now, people are going to talk about it and I think the opposition has already called today, was that right? The opposition I think have called for some type of inquiry into population. That's what we should be doing. I don't have the expertise but I think it should be out in the open. It's got nothing to do with racism. It involves all countries and all people on this wonderful earth. Thank you. Okay, Penny, other questions? Um, this might be a bit heavy, but in dealing with these issues and we're dealing with government, government is selling off a lot of things to private business. What effect will that have on community involvement? Right, well, here's the problem. I mean, it depends. I have this feeling that every person on this earth should have the same right to the world's resources. And, but don't, don't get me wrong, I don't want to s s change our borders because it would affect me and my children and grandchildren greatly. But what you're alluding to is the fact that we have borders, the, the very fact that you're saying some from, from overseas is buying Australia. I don't like it because I'm a proud Australian and one of the things I've fought for is the support of Australian farmers and Australian growers. It's interesting, people said, oh, Dick Smith, you imported electronics from Japan but you've suddenly changed your mind and you're now supporting Australian farmers. No, I haven't changed my mind. My attitude is you always buy and you always sell the best. The Japanese are the experts in electronics. We don't even make video recorders or DVDs but Australia are the best at growing food. We grow wonderful food, so I like to see Australian farmers supported. Let me get back to this issue of everyone's right to the world's resources because it touches on the fact that we have this problem, of course, in trying to make boat people to get justice for boat people. You can't actually make something just that is unjust in the first place, which are borders. Fortunately for us, in a modern developed country, all countries have borders. And there are international laws which say we can have borders. In other words, if I wanted to go to Bangladesh and I arrive there without a passport and without uh, the, the, the proper authority, I will be locked up until I'm sent back. And so that is the difficulty. In relation to people buying things from outside the country, in the short term it gives us an advantage. In the long term I think it's a disaster. It's interesting, I hear claims that the Chinese can buy land here and I think it's the Japanese can buy land here, but we're not allowed to buy land in their countries. Yeah. Well, if that's so, I think that's outrageous. But understand, if you're a politician who's going to be in for three or four years, there's great advantages in selling things off because it's a short-term gain. And let me show you the greatest Ponzi scheme that I've ever seen. This says, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, it says PM warns, warns of ageing population time bomb. Now, if this is so, if we have an ageing population time bomb that the Prime Minister is worried about, it means that we're all part of a giant Ponzi scheme, and he is too. A Ponzi scheme is a scheme where it's not sustaining. You have to keep feeding money in at the bottom, and if you don't, it collapses. 
And what we're doing is saying we need more immigrants and we need more births to have more taxpayers so we can pay for our older people. But hold on, logic says you have to keep feeding people in at the bottom and it gets more and more people as you get more as the people you fed in last year or last decade move up to the top of the Ponzi scheme or the pyramid. And that's what we're doing now. I have no doubt that you and I as a group haven't paid for our old age. Our super deductions, the money we've put aside, the money that the government has gen hasn't been enough. We're going to have to talk about that at the moment. Did you love the way that both political parties in talking about a emissions trading scheme are trying to tell us it's not going to cost us anything? Yeah. Come on, it's going to cost us money. Why don't they just say that? I can't believe it. If human-induced climate change is a fact, and I think it most likely is, it's going to cost <coughs> us money. I don't know why they don't admit to it. We can't have people saying we have an ageing population time bomb and we're going to solve it by bringing lots of people in as new taxpayers. We've got to work out solving it with 22 million or 24 million people. Thank you. Did I answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should point out that Ponzi schemes are illegal. Um, and in America, Bernie Madoff has just, has just been I can't hear you, no. for $800 million uh, dollars worth yeah. of fraud on the Ponzi scheme. Uh, Moss Lau, yes. We've just got one more question and then that's it. Yep. Okay. Um, did, oh, we, we have Christine Broadway's clean air and forest and arable land, but on a daily basis we're losing it to developers every, every minute. And it's really hard for communities to fight in the courts when the courts and the government won't stand up for it. They just see dollar values. How do we stop it? Well, you can, you're now going to be able to start to stop it because, look, this global warming is going to do something to all of our populations, even to our business leaders. The incredible thing is even the Catholic Church says we have a problem with climate change and it's most likely to be caused by humans. Now, once the Catholic Church goes down that line, they're going to have to start talking about population. And what you're talking about when it comes to developers, you'll find from this day on in Australia, I believe it's going to be in the forefront of discussing that it's all very well to talk about sustainability while you're saying we're going to go from 20 to 40 million people. You can't. Uh, Mr. Birrell, I understand, a demographer from, uh, from Monash. What's his first name? Mr. Bob Birrell, a demographer from Monash University, has shown that you simply cannot reduce our emissions per capita in the way we're planning to whilst you double the population. It's impossible. So from now on, I think you're going to find that people are going to be talking about it, thinking about it. We've got to get the message out to all Australians that, in fact, this country at about this size is a fantastic country. And what people are saying is capitalism won't work without growth. Actually, that's wrong. I'm a capitalist and I've thought about it. If with capitalism you lose a supply of any particular input or product, capitalism works around it. Let's say we're not going to have an ever-rising population with ever more consumers. So what does capitalism do? First of all, it's going to be a seller's market for labour. So people, workers will get more money. I think that's fair. We've done it too well for too long. But secondly you're going to have a situation where the CEOs of these companies, Coles and Woolworths, are going to be, have pressure on them to increase profits, but with the same number of consumers and the same number of staff, so they'll look around for doing things more efficiently. Dare I say it, buying food that is local. Dare I say it, having less useless packaging. Also, I can see us directing capitalism into electric cars. I can see us directing more money into so-called third world countries. I just think it's going to be a different direction because I know when I started Dick Smith Electronics, it was in the boom days at 68, we couldn't get staff. We used to even go to the UK and advertise for branch managers and that. But we survived and we expanded. And everyone got paid really well, but I grew a business in that time. And I have no doubt that capitalism can thrive, but it will be different and it will be harder for capitalists. I've often said 
Rupert Murdoch is at the top of the Ponzi scheme and he's only got 20 years to live. I'm up, I can't criticise him because I'm up near the top with him. But for our children and grandchildren, we'll have to start paying our way. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from uh, the outlying campuses? Now would be a good time, but also later would be a good time too. So are there any other questions from the campuses that we've talked to so far? One from Mossel. Okay. We've still got another one from Mossel, if that's okay. That's right, here you go. Fire it, yep. Yep. Dean, first of all, I've seen you on Antec though, and I've been marching with my son, for my late father, with your thank you signs, and I've seen you at state theatres giving flowers to national treasures when they've been singing. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, Judith Darren was a one percent, is a one percent. <laughs> it strikes me on the population issue that we're, we're using measures that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, Instead of using a CO2 per head of population, maybe we've got to look at how we, we do that. Maybe it should be in something like a person per kilometre, square, square kilometre. Maybe it's going to be somehow done on a, uh, an arable basis rather than desert, but a far more measurable thing. Instead of saying that Australians are one of the world's worst uh, contributors, we are maybe, in terms of arable land, maybe a, a more moderate one. And I'd encourage you to, to give some thoughts to that. Yes, yeah, so you're way above me. That's why I have to get the intellectuals from this wonderful university and universities all around the world into looking at this. And I have no doubt that the expertise is there. No one's been game to talk about the elephant in the room. From today, that's changing. I'm not going to stop talking about it. And I really believe you're going to find very quickly our politicians will quickly come on side because, as I mentioned, nine out of ten people I speak to don't want a big Australia. They don't agree with the Prime Minister. I think we've got a really good Prime Minister. I think in this particular issue, he's out of kilter with what most of the population want. Okay, any other questions? I suppose you say I didn't answer the question. It's, it's for mines greater than mine. I'm the catalyst. I don't really have the ability to, to come up with answers on these things, even to give an opinion, other than using common sense and saying, yes, we need to have a plan with how we allocate carbon dioxide emissions and we need the most effective way. By the way, I should mention here, I'm personally against the present emissions trading scheme because what I'm concerned about is the bankers selling futures, which I don't understand, and making millions of dollars out of nothing. And I'm concerned that in the end, you're going to have Macquarie Bank earning $300 million net profit out of futures in carbon trading, which must mean that it costs us more. I would love to see just a simple tax, carbon tax, that goes into a fund, a separate fund, and then that fund is used to fund various things that reduce carbon emissions. So it's nice and transparent. That's what I would like to see. <laughs> OK, last call. Uh, any other questions from Access Centres? We can come back to you, but for the moment, I'm thinking there are no more questions. All right, so we might go to questions from here. Um, no, probably none here. Oh. I just noticed. <laughs> <laughs> this is a microphone, not from Dick Smith Electronics. Right. <laughs> if it fails, it's a Tandy microphone. <laughs> but I must tell you a funny little story. When I, after two years after opening Dick Smith Electronics, Tandy from America came and opened up, can you imagine this, next door to us in York Street, Sydney. So as a good Aussie, I got all my staff together and we had this demonstration with these terrible, I feel really embarrassed these days because Americans are great people, go home yank signs and everything. <laughs> and all the paddy wagons arrived and everything. Uh, well, a couple of years ago, Dick Smith Electronics bought Tandy in Australia. So it wasn't that wonderful. <laughs> uh, Dick, you, you recommended to John Howard to introduce retrospective law. Yeah. Um, don't you think it's unfair in principle? I mean, you stuck up for X on an in-principle basis. Yep. Isn't it unfair to prosecute someone for doing something today because tomorrow you decide that what he did legally today was wrong? Yep. And so there's three parts of the question. Do you think it's fair? Do you think the High Court would have supported it? And do you think John Howard might have recognised 
uh, the report in the argument about retrospective law. Thank you. Yes, right. Well, I think because of the particular situation, I know that David Hicks would have supported retrospective legislation. So that's a slight difference. If the person to be charged said, I'll support it because I want a jury to decide on my issue. Generally speaking, I agree with the principle, but I must admit I don't have a lot of time for terrorism supporters. And I think they should be fairly treated in a court of law with due process. And because we made the error, I mean, most Australians would have thought we would have had such a law. We didn't. So in those circumstances, I must admit I was prepared to support retrospective legislation. John Howard supported what you're alluding to, that under no situation should you ever have retrospective legislation. I can understand that view. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about community engagement here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, there you are. Thank you. Okay. With the workers working longer hours, some are 12 hours a day and 35 hour days are gone, and it's common knowledge that the Australian worker probably works more hours than anyone, I'm finding that difficult as a community activist to get young people involved because they're at work or they're trying to sleep to get ready for the next shift. So I cannot agree that you're saying that the community is getting engaged. On a partial sense for the older people, yes, but the younger people, no, and I believe it's a capital sport for increasing the hours. Right. Well, capitalism has some great advantages and it also has, like anything with advantages, probably an equal number of disadvantages. It just to so happens to be the best system we've come across now, and I can't think of a better one. Um, I always say it allows people to be greedy, which we tend to be, but creams off enough from the top for the mutual benefit of everyone. The people who predicted, people like Marx who predicted... The people like Marx who predicted that capitalism would fail didn't understand that controls would be put on democracy, uh, on, on capitalism to make it work. So, um, I, I just don't know how to answer it, really. Sorry. <laughs> yes? Um, when you're coming we, up against the challenge... We might, we might go to the microphone. Come on. Microphone first, back there, and then... So, where is the question? Um, when you're coming up, up against challenges, and I believe you're probably faced by many, um, do you have a mantra or something um, inspirational that you draw upon um, to drive, that drives you? Yeah. Uh, the question was, do I have a mantra sort of to drive what I do and that? No, look, I'm a really simple person. As I said, a car radio installer. And I'm just so simple. What you get is what's here. My, I talk openly about how my mind works and... As I say, it's driven by things that make me feel good. I think many people are like that. And I'm very simple. I'm not an intellectual or an academic. I'm sorry. And so I have to go back and keep things simple. Once I was taught about karma, I suddenly thought, oh, that's what I'm on about. And even though I'm patron of the Australian sceptics, I formed the Australian sceptics here. In America, there's a very academic and intellectual group with people like Martin Gardner at the head of it called the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. I happen to be a fellow of that group and I formed the sceptics here with a couple of more learned people. And I couldn't work out, you know, why do I have this sort of simple attitude until someone said, well, karma says if you do the right thing, the right thing will happen to you. I believe there's a very sensible, practical outlook. It makes you feel good and it gives you confidence which allows you to do things. And I've never thought, I've got far more out of my country than I ever put back into it. I actually feel not too guilty about my money because I'd give it all away if it was that guilty, but I do feel that it's unfair in many ways that I have money and other people don't. And I'd like to be able to calculate that by the time I die, I've given it all away. The problem is I don't know when I'm going to die. <laughs> but I do know, I'm not planning to leave it to my kids because as my wife said, they'll travel first class everywhere and we used to travel on the back of the plane, they can too. <laughs> um, yeah. Congratulations, Dick, on living the Australian dream, well and truly. But where I'm just looking for, thank you, sorry. And being so extremely successful and a wonderful human being, a wonderful Australian. 
And we do appreciate that you may never have come across cross-corruption. However, us here in Wollongong have been faced with dreadful corruption for a long, long time, half of which we only have got to going back in history, dreadful history. And there are a lot of wonderful, decent people here, hard working like yourself. And so, um, I'm, and so now, because of that corruption, our council has been sacked and the New South Wales government has taken away our democratic right to vote or have representation at local government level. I'm wondering if you could um, share with us some ideas from your perspective that we may somehow get the resources together um, to reinstall our democratic right and get on with our Australian dream. Look, you've asked me a question um, which is completely beyond my depth of, of knowledge, I, but I, I do accept that there has been terrible corruption here and I really feel for you. I wasn't saying for a second that there is none, uh, but it's, it's, it's not as great as other countries as we all know. And I really feel for you. I would imagine now you're going to hopefully have a 50 year, 50 year period without it because of what you've learnt and generations remember things before other people can get involved again. Um, it's interesting because so often I've found, especially in the aviation industry, I've been trying to do aviation reform and pretty well failed, that people will tell me that someone's got an approval from someone in the Civil Aviation Authority and they did it by corrupt means and it virtually never is. It's someone, a bureaucrat trying to do his best or it's a misunderstanding or there's another reason and in all my experience in being a critic of the Civil Aviation Authority and then being part of it, I've never seen any corruption in that side which is good. If it, if it was there I would love to expose it because I just think it's un-Australian but I haven't seen it. I'm sorry for what's happened here in Wollongong and all I can say is I'm sure it's going to be better in the future because things normally are. <laughs> yes. Where's the microphone? So it up to the back here. Yeah, Dean, your population um, debate that you're bringing up is quite interesting, and especially the thing about everyone having equal resources. Now, I just want to uh, bring up a site that's um, now uh, on the web, the Venus Project, which is about going to a resource-based economy away from a capitalism, and it supersedes whole capitalism to communism to religion, which says there's the technology now in the world to solve all our problems. It's just that we just haven't had the monetary system in place to be able to move to that. Now, um, it's worthwhile for everyone in this room to go and get on that, that site, the Venus Project, because it talks about the whole conceptual idea of civilizational change and how the internet now has come in play and all our laws are outdated and we haven't kept up with technology. So it's worthwhile no noting that. And the question is, um, is it just population or is this, we have the resources and do we have the, do you think we could, do have the technology today or we just haven't put it in play? Yes, I think the human ability, intelligence and ingenuity is almost unlimited. I think we've got a tremendous way to go. I'm a proud capitalist. I've benefited from the system and I just wonder if a different system would work that well. It's certainly been tried in different times. Maybe this is a new invention. But I believe capitalism will work. I think if you say, let's say you say to a company, you're not going to be able to get any more coal. You can only get a standard amount of it. Well, the company will work ways of making money around that. What we're going to say to our companies, well, you can't have growth in labour anymore because the world has decided we're going to start to stabilise our population for sensible reasons. I don't think, I think capitalism will just work around it. And we have to be, the people who own shares have to be understanding that all this growth mania of where you've bought a share for a dollar and it's now worth five dollars or ten dollars, that's all false. It's completely false. That's not going to happen. You'll be indeed fortunate if you buy a share for a dollar, it remains a dollar or a little bit more and you get a reasonable return on it. That's all we should be expecting. The type of greed we've had over the last couple of decades is completely unsustainable. And we love to blame the bankers in America or the people at Macquarie Bank, but in fact, we're all responsible. We're all part of it. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't answer the question fully. <laughs> yes? Sorry. Yeah, my question was just about um, 
political donations and, and buying influence. Um, after the Board on Council and the scandal, it was, you know, uh, there was a lot of talk about reforming political donations. Now, I just want to know what you think about political donations and buying influence. And I, cause I, I was very young when it happened at the time, but I believe that you were the one that offered um, money over the Franklin Dam to, you know, and I just want to put, thought you might want to talk about that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, political donations, and there's absolutely no doubt that at the present time, that one of the reasons our politicians are all supporting growth is that they are funded by the growth industry, and that's the developers. And uh, that's understandable. Luckily, it's getting less and less secret. But the developers are very open. I mean, if you had a developer standing, he would be arguing exactly the opposite to me, that we must have growth. We must have more home units. We must be moving people from homes with backyards, the wonderful Australian backyard, into high-rise. That's their belief. Uh, obviously, we as a democracy have to listen to both sides and decide. When it comes to political donations, what you're referring to was a classic case of you have to learn from the media. I was a young, about 35-year-old, and I was down at the Franklin Blockade because, as I mentioned to you, I loved, as well as electronics, I loved the out of doors, and I'd been into Lake Pedder as a bushwalker. Not many people have been to the original Lake Pedder and stood on the beach and then watch it be destroyed and not done anything about it. So I went down to help Bob Brown. I la loaded radios onto cliff tops and assisted with the blockade. And one day the media was standing there and they said to Bob, well, you know, would you go to jail to save this river? And, and he said, yes, I'd go to jail to save it. And they said to me, well, what would you pay? Would you pay a million dollars? And I said, well, of course I'd pay a million dollars. And then they said, well, who to? Would you pay it to a political party? And, and quite naively I said, yes but not secretly. <laughs> in other words, it was not anything other than what happens normally. What I loved is the media made this huge uh, thing about it and I said, hold on, that's what happens normally. People pay money to stop political parties to do things. As it was, I never paid the million dollars and as you know, the dam didn't go ahead, thank heavens. But it was being naive at the time and now I've never, my donations to political parties are very small, they're always transparent. Obviously, political parties need money to operate. I noticed recently in the United States there was a high court hearing where it said that it's within their freedom of speech that political parties can receive donations from anyone in the United States, and that means that you need donations of hundreds of millions of dollars to even have a hope of standing in politics in the United States. Well, that's democracy gone mad. Luckily, we don't have that situation here. If someone supported no donations at all and taxpayer-funded political donations, we have a certain amount at the moment, I, I, that's the type of thing that I might go towards supporting, but I'd like to hear both sides of the argument. Thank you. Yes. Um, John Hatton down here, someone up in the back. The back's got it at the moment. Too hard to bring the microphone down. going with the microphone. So oh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned your fellow capitalists that advise you. Who were they? Were they the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers Foundation? <laughs> no. Um, I, I read in the paper where you actually said that uh, Dick Smith Foods were promoting the swine flu vaccine. Oh. Yeah. So Did I say that? <laughs> well, actually, I thought I'd ask you when you spoke because the paper actually had that in there. And I was just wondering if it was true. No, I've, I've never heard of that. No, and it wasn't true. Yeah. Dick Smith has peanut butter made by sanitarium and a beautiful cereal made by sanitarium which at least it's manufactured in Australia. As most people know, it's the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have great problems in getting any Aussie producers. There's hardly any left. And as we started to buy and make a producer more successful, Greens was a good example, suddenly they could be bought out by overseas. We started Golden Circle was one of our biggest suppliers of soft drinks that are now owned by some foreign company. So as we made them successful, anyone successful sells out to the United States. It's very sad, so it's very hard to support Aussie companies. They're just simply not here. By the way, I'm not saying it's all bad. We've got food cheaper than we've ever been, which will make us more obese, no doubt. And products are cheaper than they've ever been. TV sets and things like that, these efficiencies of scale, it's allowing China to raise its standard of living. That's good. And uh, wars are caused normally because people are, are, have little and they're also caused by population not having enough room and so forth. That's another reason we should look at population. Yes, next question. 
Um, could you talk about Nigel Brennan and your motives and the process that you and the family went through to get him back home? Yes, certainly. And this is a, an example of community empowerment. It's a great question. It's something where governments are no good at it. Uh, what happened was I was approached by Nigel Brennan's father who got in touch with me through Bob Brown and whenever Bob Brown rings me, I know it's going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> so I've said to Bob Brown, stop phoning. <laughs> anyway, Bob rang me and said, look, there's this terrible situation. Do you know about this young Aussie who's been kidnapped in Somalia and his partner who is from Canada? And I said, yes, I know. I've just heard a little bit about it, hardly anything. Well, could uh, Mr Brennan, Jeff Brennan, the father, phone you and ask you some information? So he didn't phone me. He came and saw me and his story was very, very sad. He'd said that for his son was kidnapped with the Canadian lady and for 11 months the Australian government had negotiated with the kidnappers but had a policy of not paying ransoms. And so in the 11 months I'd got absolutely nowhere. He said, the family has now taken over the negotiations and we are employing a fixer. I think the company was called AKE International in the United Kingdom, who were charging $5,000 US a day to get the two out and they thought at the very worst it could cost $2.5 million. Uh, would I help? And then he told me how he was going around, and I kid you not, running sausage sizzles and raising, I mean, I almost cry when I think of it, $500 and things like that. And I stopped and thought, wow, giving money to criminals? That's, that's a big take. I said, why won't the government do anything? And he said, we've had to take it back. We're not going to get anywhere with the government. We've been told that. So he gave me the name of the bureaucrat in the government who I phoned and I rarely lose my temper but I lost my temper with this bloke because he never answered any question. I said things like, okay, you can't pay a ransom if I do. Will that be creating a precedent? Because I don't want to do that. He just would never give an answer which really got me angry. I said, off the record, tell me what to do. Finally, I rang an ex-minister uh, of foreign affairs minister, Alexander Downer. And I said, what would you suggest? And he said, well, Dick, I can tell you, if a, if a ransom is not paid, they'll either be killed or a ransom is paid. It's as simple as that. That's the story. I then had di oh, then I asked, asked Jeff Brennan, have you asked anyone else? Everyone comes to me. And he told me this incredibly sad story, how he'd been to basically all of the billionaires. And he'd even got through to the secretaries and explained that his son was kidnapped and the government couldn't do anything and his son was likely to die. And he got phone calls back from secretaries but couldn't get any money. That night, I was talking to my wife and I told her the story and we said, if it was our child, what would we do? And we would pay the money. So I said to the Brennans, don't worry about money anymore. We will provide that. <laughs> and I've told you how karma helps. It was going to cost a tremendous amount of money. It could have been, the worst case, two and a half million. It cost nothing like that. In the end, the families raise money everywhere. The Canadians raise money. And I, I think I've, I've put in less than $500,000 and they're even sending money back to me. They're such an honourable family, which will allow me to donate to other causes. And they're both back and alive and healthy. We weren't creating a precedence. We've been told by experts, if someone goes to Somalia and is kidnapped, you, you either pay or they die. No one has ever got out without paying. And so my advice to everyone is don't go to that country. There's no government. And, but I met a wonderful family, just a wonderful family who just got around. Do you realise that the Canadian girl had problems? So when the father approached me, he said, by the way, we, we're raising the money for both, not just for Nigel. Any money you put in Dick has to be for both. That's wonderful. So they are most wonderful people. I met some wonderful Australians 
who are out there raising money so they can sort of pay back. And I said it was a gift. It's not to be paid back, but they send money back to me. And the same to Bob Brown. Wonderful family. And it turned out good. They're alive. It was a wonderful, wonderful result. And by the way, it was a typical example I've written to the government saying, you have a policy of not paying ransoms. I believe that's a sensible policy to protect Australians. The mistake you made is you immediately should have told the family to go to one of these experts at doing it. If you work for the ABC or if you work for Foreign Affairs, you're insured through AKE or a similar company. And when I dealt with this bloke in England who was the expert in getting them out, he said, Dick, in 30 years, I've only had one fatality. I've got lots of people out. I have never, ever worked for a private family. I've always worked for insurance companies with just unlimited amounts of money. And here it was, the first private family. And my suggestion, hopefully, I think there's going to be a Senate inquiry that Bob Brown will get going. And hopefully the recommendation comes, first of all, don't go there. And number two, if it happens again, the government should immediately uh, give the names of these three companies to the parents and let the parents raise the money through helpful people and do it privately. That's the sensible thing to do. Big governments are not good at negotiating with criminals. And these people are the worst type of criminal you could ever imagine. Yes, any questions? Uh, how are we going for time, by the way? Is it We've got about just 20 minutes. 20 minutes, good. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say thank you for being such an inspiration, Dick. Uh, yeah. Where am I looking? Here. Oh, sorry, uh, John. Yeah. And for example, John got me into this. <laughs> I very rarely give public talk. <laughs> I think I said no, and he somehow took it as a yes. <laughs> yeah, well, after all, I was a politician. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was very nice of you to grace us with your presence and to set such a shining example. Uh, in your population and resources question, did you take the very simple argument, which I often say to the climate sceptics, 4,000 million years ago, you had a planet that was poisonous. It took all of those millions of years to take the lead and the cadmium and the sulfur and, and the carbon dioxide and the methane and so on and store it underground in coal and oil. And we're busy digging it up and we're all putting it back in the atmosphere and you're telling me that climate change is not related to human activity. John, you're a man of my own thinking. In fact, when I've said it's common sense that if you burn in a couple of hundred years carbon which has taken millions of years to sequester, it's obvious you're going to have an effect. And when I get scientists on either side, in my Australian sceptics, which we're not climate change sceptics by the way, but the Australian sceptics, one of our members is Ian Plymer, who's, he is a scientist, a geologist, who says that the climate change is coming from other means other than carbon. I don't agree with him, even though I'm a simple car radio installer. I agree with John. It's most likely if you burn up that amount. Do you realise, as a pilot, I know how thin the atmosphere is. If I take off in my little citation plane, I fly at 30,000 feet. If I have a depressurisation, I will die in two minutes. 30,000 feet is about five miles altitude. Put that on a globe. As Al Gore says, it's like a thin veneer of varnish on the globe of atmosphere. So don't think that atmosphere is big and to burn for 200 years the most incredible amount of pollution into it, obviously you're going to affect it. And so I, I think it's proven as far as I'm concerned. By the way, even if it isn't, surely we should conserve these non-renewable resources and have them from our grandchildren and people further on. Sorry, was that the finish of the question, John? I interrupted. Thank you. Yes. 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 Um, Thank you again for, for the lecture, as everyone was saying, but you have had an amazing set of, of outdoor adventures, so I thought I'd leave the topic over there. Just for example, off the top of your head, uh, what is the most uplifting experience you've had and what's the riskiest? Right. Well, probably the riskiest, and it's interesting because people, the most constant question people ask me, what's your next adventure? And actually, there's not another one, I hope, because all of my heroes kill themselves. Alm <laughs> Smithy, admittedly the technology was different then, but if you take relatively high risks, even though I manage my risks, you can get away with it for a certain time. And 
I'll give you an, advan a, a, an idea of probably the riskiest thing I've ever done. When I decided to fly solo around the world in a little tiny helicopter, at that stage, until that point, most helicopters were used by TV news crews to, you know, cross the city, 10 minute flight. And I'd worked out that I should be able to fly around the world as long as I, the reason no one had ever done it before is that since helicopters had existed in 1947, the Cold War had existed and they wouldn't let you fly through Russia. And of course you can't get across the Pacific. So I had decided that I'd sure I would get approval to fly in Russia, which meant crossing the northern Atlantic via Greenland, coming down to Australia, going up to Japan, a couple of landings in Russia, in Siberia, and then on to Alaska and back to Fort Worth in America where I started. Well, after six months of negotiations with the Russians, and I'm sure I must have got on the ASIO hit list, at one stage I even bought them, I wanted to send them a fax, and they said, we don't have a fax machine. So I sent them a fax machine <laughs> and installed it for them for nothing. <laughs> and Anyway, they tried to do everything they could, the rushing diplomatic corps, but they couldn't get me approval. So my, my way out was to, I'd said, if they can't get approval to land in Russia, I'm going to land on a ship halfway between Japan and Alaska. And I really never thought I'd have to do it. Well, in the end, it meant either not doing the flight or doing it. So I wrote to 200 shipping companies, 196 obviously threw it in the bin, a couple wrote back saying, are you for real? And, and one, the Hogue Company from Norway, I shall be forever grateful, said, we love your spirit of adventure. We have a ship, a container ship, going on the 25th of June from Japan to Seattle. If you want to put some drums on, the board of, on board that ship, and as long as we don't have to change our course or stop, you're welcome to find it and fill up with fuel. Now, remember, these are the days before GPS. So... I went to my friendly Dick Smith's shop and bought some electronic components and a friend made a beacon up, a directional beacon. I put one of my ham radio friends on the ship in Yokohama. He went and three and a half days across the Pacific, I got to the northern tip of Japan. I departed at 3am in pitch darkness, I can remember to this day, going from one light to the next landing light on this airport and then just climbing off into the fog and going straight onto instruments, even though the helicopter wasn't instrument rated and I wasn't supposed to fly on instruments. I climbed up and the dawn came up. If ever I write a book and I'm going to say north into the dawn. And I climbed into the dawn and I flew for seven hours. Finally I communicated with the ship. Then I managed to get my beacon pointing towards the ship. I'm sitting in this tiny little helicopter. It's a little Bell Jet Ranger. Beside me was a life raft and a survival beacon. 20% overload of fuel in the back. Uh, no floats on the helicopter, one engine. So if I'd ended up in the drink, it would be 30 seconds to climb out, try and get the life raft up. And as I was about, I was flying through the Russian restricted area because I didn't have enough room to get around it. And the Japanese said, oh, you can't fly through there in their sort of Japanese English, you'll be shot down. And I said, no way, they wouldn't do that. Three months almost to the day, they shot the Korean jet, 007, in the same area. But they never knew I was there. I was too tiny, I'm positive. And as I got to within about 80 miles of the ship, my ham radio operator called up Don Richards and said, Dick, bad news, the ship's in fog. You won't be able to land here. So I managed to call a high-flying airliner and the mayday is the worst message, so I gave a pan message. I said, I'm an Australian helicopter trying to fly around the world. I'm looking for a ship that's gone into fog. I'm going to head towards Russia. I still had enough fuel to get to Russia, to a volcano I could see sticking out of the cloud. I said, I'm going to head towards that. Can you notify the Australian authorities to tell the Russians? <laughs> well, how is this for luck? Ten minutes later, as I head towards Russia, the ship calls back and says, we're in a, an open area. We'll slow down. We're in an open area. So I just turned. I descended through the cloud. And I'm not a religious bloke, I said, but in front of me was a group of those beautiful orca whales rolling. And that was my good luck charm. And there I saw this little dot. I reckon I could see it 70 miles away, but someone said, oh, you can't see that far. Well, as I got closer, there was a ship. I'd never landed on a ship before. Landed on the ship, we started pumping the drums in, but I'd made one serious error. I'd allowed six hours to the ship, one hour for refuelling, six hours to Shemya, the end of the Aleutian chain, 13 hours changing through 11 time zones, but landing the day before I started. And I'd, 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 land, I'd allowed 
enough time to land before darkness. But the ship was rolling, and what I didn't allow for in helicopters, the fuel tanks on the side, so every time it rolled this way, the fuel would come out. So we'd have to put the cap back on and wait for it to roll this way and put a couple of pumps in. So it took two hours to refuel. So then I knew I was going to get in one hour late. I managed to get airborne. I was told later, as I got airborne with this great overlight, I moved to the side of the ship and it appears there's a big lug where they hold the containers down. I missed it by inches. It just would have rolled the helicopter. And I dropped down and got what we call ground effect and then headed off with my beacon pointing towards this, re this American Air Force base, a secret Air Force base that I'd got approval to land at. And six hours later in absolute Arctic twilight, I flew in past the Attu Island and landed at this little airfield where these Americans were waiting for me. And that to me was, I think I worked out, I manage risk, that's how I do my adventures. Any of w one out of ten things could have gone wrong, which would have meant I would either be in the water or in Russia. And all of the ten went right. And they were all in series. They weren't in parallel. <laughs> Everyone had to work. And so that probably was the riskiest thing I've ever done. The most exciting was when I was going to fly a balloon from Australia to New Zealand. And no one had ever done that before. And you know balloons always fly around the world from west to east because that's the way the jet stream and the winds go. My mate John Singleton says, oh no, fly the other way. <laughs> and I said, John, that's impossible. And he said, I bet you 100 grand you can't. <laughs> ah. So I rang up the Met Bureau and they first of all said it was impossible, but then they said, hold on. If you have a blocking high over the Great Australian Bight, they said, how low can you fly? They said, because then you get a high pressure system over the Tasman and with a high pressure system the wind goes anti-clockwise and you may be able to take off from New Zealand fly around at low level on the high pressure system and hit the coast. They said the problem is that if the system moves to the east, you'll parallel the coast and then end up in Antarctica. <laughs> ah. So I rang up John and I said, is that bet still on? He said, yes. So we sent the balloon over instead of having it here on the coast here to go that way. And we waited until the Met Bureau said, tomorrow should be the ideal day. We jumped over there and people who know, 40 hours later, we landed on the beach just south of Surface Paradise, having done the first flight across the Tasman in any direction, but we did it against the wind. And that was very exciting because most balloon flights from continent to continent or around the world always land inland. We actually dropped the gondola onto the surf and rowed it in onto the beach. <laughs> and that was very exciting. I remember with modern communications now, we had our plane circling us and doing an interview with Today Tonight. And I'd kidded them that we were catching fish on the way and because we were so low. So we'd bought some fish at the fish shop. So when the, uh, it was Ray Martin or someone says, well, what about the fishing? So I held up the fish. But the mistake I'd made, it was a freshwater fish I'd <laughs> So anyone who knew fish knew we hadn't caught it in the Tasman. <laughs> So there you are. And by the way, I hated the little gondola was so enclosed, I'd built a deck chair, a sun deck on the side, and I sat on my deck chair, and it was just magnificent, sailing along in complete silence with the, the free of the wear. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. I'm up here, Dick. Up here. For a simple man, you are having an awesome life. Oh, a few more questions. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Just one more. Yeah. Um, my question is, what are your feelings about Australia leading the way? And if you can do all that that you've just told us about, perhaps you could even get governments on side here. But what about a summit here in Sydney, Australia, put us on the world map, and perhaps bring in the World Health Organization the World Food Organization. They did it for climate change, so if you're so concerned about our population having an impact on our climate, surely those organizations should be brought on board? Right, I, I don't think I have those abilities. As I said, my ability is to say it how it is. And I think there's many people, hopefully there'll be some here today, who have the ability to organise things like that. And in my success, I mentioned how I've always, maybe I didn't, 
people ask me, what's your secrets for success? And I say, first of all, I, I say success is when you've been able to place yourself in a position to have the freedom to do what you want to do. That's my description of success. And if I had become a National Park Ranger, which was my other alternative, hopefully I'd be the superintendent today and I would be just as successful as I am now because that's what I wanted to do. Now, success, success forces are surround yourself with capable people and get them to perform. And my whole success in electronics and publishing and in food, the three companies I've had, is because I've done just that. I just, I can pick good people. I've always paid them extremely well. I've motivated them and they've got abilities I don't have. And in this particular case, I'm going to be the person who hopefully will communicate it around Australia. Dare I say it, I think it would be saying too much to say the world, but at least in Australia. And I know good people will suddenly leap in and organise the type of thing you're talking about. Hopefully from this, this is my first talk I've ever given on it. And I've almost hijacked the talk, haven't I? Because it wasn't going to be about population. But I thought, let's mention something which is important to me. And we could find that there's a start now, and right around Australia, it's talked about all the time, and that'll be the best thing. I have, I think we have a robust and a fantastic democracy. I think in general, our politicians reflect what we want, they rarely lead. That's very dangerous for a po politician. And I'm hoping our Prime Minister, who I admire, I've admired all of our Prime Ministers, we've been well led in my lifetime, will say, oh, well, maybe most of the people want to look at population, let's do it that. Let's have a summit. And he's the man to do it. And they sh there should be one in Australia and then there should be a world one. And, it, and it, without doubt it should work out ways of not only increasing population but starting to reduce it a bit. And, and by the way, have you seen that ad on TV called, and it's for free-to-air TV and there's all these people saying more for me? Yes. Well, it's interesting. Some brilliant advertising agent has obviously worked out that we're really pretty selfish. And if it's more for me, well, let, let me tell you, if you have 40 million people in Australia, you can get half as much as if we have 20 million because our wealth is a certain amount. Have two kids, you can give them half your inheritance. Have four, only half as much for each one. So if we're going to talk of more for me, 20 million is a lot better than 40 million because the intrinsic worth of this country is the wonderful resources, the potential of the farming land and all the rest of it, not having too many people. More for me, maybe that should be the slogan. <laughs> a good one for human beings. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Um, hello, I recently watched an interview with Bob Hawke and Andy Denton uh, where Bob Hawke says he's really concerned for our grandchildren with the age of technology. I too, as a grandmother, feel the same way because with the fast foods, the drugs, the computers, the lack of exercise, uh, incorrect diet, diabetes, it's killing our children, and no wonder, I mean, older people are living longer because we probably take more care than bringing up our children. He's winding you so up. What, uh, so yeah. what I would like to know is, like in Sweden they had the onslaught lunch, uh, and they didn't let children watch TV until after six. But I would like to know, could we incorporate some sort of programs in the schools for driving and diet and all these things that mean our children are our future and what can we do to sustain them in a better way? Certainly. First of all, I saw that Bob Hawke interview and did you notice he mentioned population? He said he's very concerned about the increase in population, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, by the way, I used to get Onslow lunches in 1950 at Roseville Public School. Uh, isn't that wonderful? Yes. The, the, the problem of obesity and so forth is a problem. The my confidence I give is things go in cycles. And as I've said, the scout movement is starting to build up again. Kids are now starting to get bored with sitting in front and playing a TV game and they're now doing a bit of risk taking. We, we've got to be careful as a society. We cotton wool our kids. When I was a kid, we'd all climb in the Scoutmaster's truck. Can you imagine this? And go to the Scout camp. 30 of us yelling and shouting. Nowadays, you have to be in a seatbelt. 
uh, it's the rules and everything. And my little grandson was walking in the bush and, and I was saying, don't go there, you'll get a tick. And then I thought, hold on, let him have a tick. You know? <laughs> uh, and I really believe we should allow our young people to take risk because if we don't, as you're alluding to, they'll have a terrible diet, they'll get onto drugs and all of the things which can happen because they're not living an out-of-door life. That's why we want backyards and we want spare blocks of land, not everyone living in home units, if possible. Okay, last, last question. Last question. Hi, Dick. Over here. Over here, sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, just one last question. You've been a really successful businessman, and as you said, you, you feel yourself, you're a catalyst, um, which means that you need to get lots of people on board all the time, and I think a big part of this subject is community engagement and getting people motivated and working towards a common goal. In all of your adventures and all of your interaction with diverse populations, have you had any insights into humanity or motivating others that you'd like to share with us today? Um, no better than what I've done here today. I mean, it's a wonderful audience. And I, I know my limitations. It's interesting, I've attempted various things in my life and they're always things, I'm a bit of a coward that I think there's a good chance of doing. And when you, I think one of the people mentioned here, could I motivate Australia, motivate the world? I don't think I have got those abilities, but I can certainly be the person who says it, how it is. Um, I, I look, I'm not an academic, I'm not an intellectual. I don't have the ability to think that deeply about the way I act, what you see is what you get. I've been very fortunate. I've been able to say it how it is because if someone sues me, I once asked my solicitor, I said, what's the biggest defamation amount that's ever been given in Australia? And it was an amount, believe it or not, that I could afford. Now, don't, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that I go around defaming people, but it means I can speak freely. Because many people, if you have a job or a house or a mortgage, you can't do that. So I've been fortunate enough to get in this position, so I say it as it is. I do everything I can not to offend or hurt people, but I say it how it is and I'll continue to do that. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>